Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Nicomachean Ethics, Book 7, in the course of discussing the phenomenon of lack or loss of self-control, that is, acrosia, uh, Aristotle is going to bring up something that he discusses at other points in his works, never quite enough, never quite what we'd want, so in a way it's both uh, illuminating and also puzzling, and has given rise to a lot of discussion by, by commentators and scholars for years. And that uh, thing, that idea, is what we call the practical syllogism. Um, a practical syllogism is a mode, like I put here, a, a way of engaging in practical or moral reasoning. A, a syllogism itself, a sulegosmos, is a particular form of reasoning or argumentation and Aristotle tells us a bit more about these, actually quite a bit more about these, in terms of um, theoretical or, or speculative reasoning in some of his other works. When it comes to practical matters, we can, in, and we do in fact, often make arguments about them. Uh, deliberation about what we ought to do quite often involves articulating why it is that we ought to do something and trying to convince ourselves or trying to convince others that one one path is, is better than the others out of the possibilities. Now, this term sulegosmos that um, Aristotle is using, some people take it to always mean exactly the same form of argument, uh, which is that it has three statements or propositions that are arranged in a certain way, two of them being premises, one of them being the conclusion, arranged more or less like this. These are two premises. That's the conclusion of the syllogism. Um, my own view on this, and I'm not the, the only person who holds this, <coughs> is that that cannot possibly be the entire story because as we often see, we need a whole bunch of other premises coming in uh, in order to fill it out. Um, Aristotle also talks in the rhetoric about you know, enthymemes and uh, which, which are syllogisms that are lacking one of the terms where you have to kind of supply it yourself. He also discusses, uh, both in that work and in several other places, including the Nicomachean Ethics, the role of the middle term that connects the major and minor premise together, and you know, how a person finds that. He talks about facility in, in uh, deriving or constructing syllogisms. There's a lot more involved in this topic, but, but for the purposes of this video, I want to try to stick as closely with what Aristotle is actually giving us here in Nicomachean Ethics Book 7, and then you can decide whether it's, it's really sufficient for moral or practical argumentation, or whether the account needs to be filled out additionally. So, going back to this, traditionally in a syllogism there are three statements. There's what is called the major premise, which Aristotle says deals with things that are universal uh, or general. Because um, remember, in, in ethics, <clears throat> we have to keep in mind that um, we're talking about things as they generally happen, not as they always by necessity happen. Um, we have a minor premise as well, and the minor premise, as he's going to say, deals with the particulars, which are, in, in large respect, a matter for what we can call perception or observation, aesthesis. Um, by the way, you should probably also take a look at the core concept video on intellect or nous, um, understanding, because that will, will also give you some of the, the information about this. Now, in a, in a, in a regular syllogism, a, a non-practical one, one which is not, as Aristotle says, 
entities practicas in in practical matters. You know, um, what we're doing is we have a major premise, which is some sort of statement. X is Y. Another uh, uh, statement as well. Another premise. Y is Z, and we have get a conclusion, which is something that we know and we assent to. Uh, X is Z, right? You know, there, there we're talking about, um, you know, uh, something like, uh, what is it, commutivity, transitivity, transitivity. Um, in the case of practical syllogisms, Aristotle says that they actually culminate in, not in a statement, but they culminate in an action. Uh, they, they move us to doing things. This is one of the areas where we might want to say, that seems a little far-fetched. Um, perhaps that's not always the case. Sometimes maybe they result in the imperative, hey, you should go do that thing, because we know that people engage in reasoning and don't always follow their, their reasoning. We're talking about this precisely in the context of Acrasia. But in any case, he says, uh, when the two premises are combined, just as in theoretic reasoning, the mind is compelled to affirm the resulting conclusion, so in the case of practical premises, you are forced at once, and he uses that, euthus, at once, to do it. So the example that he uses there, which I think can be very helpful for illustrating this, is all sweet things are to be tasted. So, you know, let's assume that you actually accept that, that premise. Probably you shouldn't, because he says at the same time, you know, um, <clears throat> you've also got in mind, don't eat those sorts of things over there, right? That thing over there is sweet, therefore go taste that thing. And, and if Aristotle, if the account that he's giving here is actually the complete one, then you don't actually hear like a voice in your head saying, go taste that thing. You just go and, and taste that thing. Um, likewise, you know, we could say, you know, um, all honors are, be, are to be desired. That's an honor. I should desire that honor, or I should pursue that honor, however we else we want to put it. Now, this one already, by its own nature, when I thought about it, illustrates the fact that there can't just be two premises. Why? How do you know that thing over there is sweet? You know something to be sweet because you actually have tasted it, right? Or you are going by some other index. For example, that thing over there is a strawberry, and strawberries are sweet, going by my previous experience, so I should go over and taste that thing. Most likely what we ought to think about is that these, these, these uh, propositions that form the premises could probably be expanded into a whole uh, much longer argument, you know, using some background knowledge, involving some other inferences going on. And it's useful to do that because it, that might actually help us to, to syllogize, as Aristotle says, he uses that as a verb, to syllogize better. Um, but in any case, this is how Aristotle depicts the practical syllogism. Uh, perhaps it's somewhat different uh, in, in the way that it really works compared to this model here that we have, but this model at least gives us something that we can start with, and in the case of trying to make sense out of what he's saying in Nicomachean Ethics Book 7 about Acrasia, this is what you want to have in mind. 